we got two of the gold medals here. We have this. This first one was Beijing. Woo! This was my first Olympic gold. Look at that beauty. And I won this race by the largest margin in Olympic history. I won by a full second. But was this your PR? Yes. This is the fastest this you ever ran. This was the fastest I ran. Yo, 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 welcome to another episode of the Founder Podcast. Today, I have Mr. LaShawn Merritt. Yes, For those that don't know who LaShawn is, this is the greatest Olympian 400 runner of all time, right? right? Absolutely. 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 Hey, de definitely, everybody in this room is going to agree. So, <laughs> <laughs> so LaShawn is a three-time gold medalist. Absolutely. Three-time gold medalist, once in the individual 400 and twice as the anchor in the four by four. It's just absolutely phenomenal. And, you know, if it wasn't for injury, probably he probably would have racked up a few more of those. You're right. Mm, mm. So super excited to have you on the on the show today, LaShawn. Uh, we're, we're coming to you guys from a, a little suite in Las Vegas. Had the opportunity to uh, meet LaShawn at one of uh, my good friend David Meltzer's uh, events. LaShawn hangs with the cool crowd. And, uh, you know, I was really impressed by you, LaShawn, just like, uh, one, your humility and just like principle based family man, you know, somebody that uh, like I really connected with. In fact, like Dave Meltzer is is pretty phenomenal, like putting together a good crowd. I don't he know is. if you've you've uh, gotten that same vibe. He is. You know what? I uh, I've been moving around the U.S. with him for the past maybe four months. It's always a different crowd. It's always love in the crowd. Everyone's about gratitude and helping one another. And there's this high vibration of energy that I move on. So I love that guy. Yeah. And happy to be here. Yeah, yeah, man. It's good. It's good to have you. So, man, love to uh, get to know you a little bit better. Tell your story. Okay. So you're 37 years old. 37. 37 years old. Where Where were you from originally? From Portsmouth, Virginia. Cool. Grew up in a small town in Virginia. Um, not a lot goes on there. Okay. It's a big, uh, Navy military area. Okay. So growing up, there wasn't a lot of role models or people you kind of saw on TV or wanted to be like outside of the blue collar workers. Okay. You know, parents weren't athletes, but I just happened to be a standout athlete, man. Okay. Yes. So early, early on, how, how many kids were in your family? Like what, what was it like growing up? So growing up, uh, it was me, my younger sister, who's three years younger, and I have an older brother who's five years older. Okay. I played baseball, football, and basketball when I was younger. I was always the fastest in everything. Didn't know how to run, but I was fast. I was always uh, trying to race my brother's friends also. I can remember like it was yesterday in the middle of the street. My parents have film of me walking around asking people at cookouts, do they want to race? Mm. When I saw that not too long ago, I said, man, this is, life goes full circle. It comes mm. around full circle. Um, elementary school, my, my mentor husband, well, my mentor was my third grade teacher's husband. Okay. And my mom worked at my elementary school. Okay. So from the age of six or seven, I've had this thing where you have to do what you have to do in order to do what you want to do. You know, I couldn't act up in school or get bad grades in school, or I couldn't compete at any of the sports after school. Yeah. So I learned that very young in life, um, how important handling business was, how important respect was, and just having great character. Um, and so he was a mentor at a, at a young age for you. He was. Uh, was was he like the the one? What about your dad? Was he involved in your life? So my dad wasn't around. He worked a lot. Yeah. You know, he always told me uh, I came from a good root. Mm. I got good blood, mm. um, and I was a special child. My mentor was more disciplined. Mm -hmm. uh, I was in those team sports, so that's where that discipline came from and the work ethic. He would invite a couple kids to his house often. And he would cook and we would watch him cook. We would set the table. He had a gym in his house. So when I think about it now, it's crazy. Third grade, I was running on treadmills and doing push-ups. No way. Yes. So he's training you early. He trained me early. Not yeah. necessarily for anything in particular, but just life. Yeah. You know, he set me up great for life. 
Um, Which it, back in that day, it wasn't very common, right? Like, I don't know, you see a lot more in, in today's society where like little kids are training if, to be athletes, right? They they have all these different like athletic training boot camps right. and, and everything. Man, back in my day, I, I don't know if yours was the same experience. It was like, there was just like school sports, right. like a, a couple like club things, but like you weren't you weren't training in third grade. Yeah, and it wasn't as many camps, I don't think. Right. But he he was a guy who... In the community, he's always had football teams. So he was the guy in the community who would take the kids in, who didn't have uh, father figures. And his niece married Bruce Smith. Mm. Bruce Smith is Hall of Famer. Uh, he was from my area in Norfolk. So I actually got to go to his house maybe once a month when I was younger. Go from the hood where it's dirt everywhere and I couldn't keep my shoes clean to this multi-million dollar mansion out in Virginia Beach. So I would go out there, go to a cookout, come back to the hood. So uh, when you when you'd go and experience that, like how did that make you feel? When I think about it, um, I think later on in life, it really hit me. During that time, I just was, we're going to a pool, we're going out here, this is a huge house. I'll never be in this position. Hmm. You know, that's what a lot of kids were thinking. We were from a small city. Mm -hmm. And Virginia Beach was only maybe 30 minutes out, but you had all the major players out there. Yeah. Um, I never thought I would reach that high, you yeah. know, but it it was instilled in me without me really knowing it that when it was time for me to go to that next level in life and to become a professional, in my mind, I thought, you know, I know somebody from my area who actually have done this. Only one. I've only met one and let me know that it was possible. So it really sounds like, I mean, he set the the bar for possibility. Right, and, right. but I didn't notice it at the time. Right. When I was younger, I'm just going back and forth. But when it was my turn, I knew that it was possible. Yeah, that I think that's like such an important aspect in any successful person's life, right, is that they have a mentor, have somebody that, that gets them outside of their own experience, right. their own environment, and says, hey, you need to think bigger, mm -hmm. right? You need, this is possible. You are worthy. You right. are, you have the potential, you know? Right. And, and, and so that's, that's so cool that uh, you were able to experience that. And, and help me understand, so how was that connection made? That was through your mentor? So my mentor niece married him. Okay. Yeah, so he was family. Yeah. And I talked to him to this day. I'm still close with that whole family. That's so cool. Yeah. That's awesome. So you're an incredible athlete from from a young age, excelling in all sports. Yes. Awesome. Yeah. What about your brother? Was he much of an athlete? He was. He was a baseball player. Yeah. Um, when I was younger, he was the guy who, if I would make a touchdown, he would give me ten dollars every home run. He would give me five dollars, type of thing. But he never got a chance to see me run track. Mm. He passed away before I actually started running. Oh man! And he became a big uh, light inside of me, a, a second voice, and a motivating factor for me. How old were you when he passed away? I was twelve. Mm -hmm. I was eighth grade. Uh, he was a freshman in college. Freshman in college, he went to college. He was a musician also. Played the trumpet. I played the trumpet too. I followed pretty much right in his footsteps. And he got on an altercation with a guy at a basketball court his freshman year. The guy ended up going to the hospital and the guy was on an off-campus fraternity and some guys showed up at my brother's dorm room and he ended up out of the window on the ninth floor and passed away. He was a freshman and I was eighth grade. Yeah. So if you don't mind talking about it, how was it receiving that news? You know, my mom always tell me that she don't think I dealt with it like I should have. She said I didn't cry a lot. She was actually going to send me to a um, psychiatrist to see kind of what was going on. When I think about it now, it was sort of a blur until track found me. When track and field found me, and I started running, I felt like I had help. I really felt like I had help doing some of the races. Um, a lot of things came more easy 
in that sport than any other sport I've done. Yeah. And I took it as a as a blessing that I could have an extra motivating factor. I didn't grow up with my parents stressing me in sports. Neither one of my parents were athletes. Uh, so I didn't have this uh, trying to live, my dad trying to live through right. me or a lot of stress. My mom has always told me to go out and have fun with whatever, with whatever I did in life. Yeah. My dad was always the guy who told me, man, you ain't seen nothing yet. Uh, after I won the Olympics, World Championships, you ain't seen nothing yet. So he let me know that there was a higher power and I was, I was set up for greatness. That's awesome. Yeah. So are both your parents uh, big believers? My dad is, my mom is also. Um, I grew up in the church. Mm -hmm. uh, my grandma and my granddad were preachers. Mm -hmm. um, I studied it when I was younger. You know, I have a faith that we're here for a reason. Yeah. Um, everybody has a light inside of them. I was fortunate enough to find one of my purposes early on in life. You know, it was not just fast, but people always came to me as the example, you know, and I had to take that on. Not that I, I wanted to be the example, I'm really an introvert. Yeah. Real introvert. And I was just put in a position to have to motivate, have to inspire. So, I realized the gift and I just, I rode with it. I yeah. rode with it. So if you don't mind, let's, let's go back to your brother's passing. So it, uh, uh, you didn't deal with it in a traditional sense from a, a, a sorrow or, or crying or whatnot. What, what was going through your mind though? Like what, I mean, there, there had to be something mm -hmm. that, like, cause I, I actually deal with grief very similarly. Mm -hmm. Like it's bad. I, I cry when I'm actually happy and inspired mm -hmm. and I don't cry as much when I'm sad. Mm -hmm. and, and so, I understand that. And, and so it, like I, I can connect with you. Like, like for me, I'd, I'd take a situation like that and be like, all right, man, how, how can I use this in a way that isn't going to drag me down? Or right. like that, what, what went through your mind at that point? I was so young. I was so young. I really didn't know what was going on. I, I saw my mom and dad grieving. Yeah. And maybe I thought I had to be the strong one at the time. Mm. I think that was what it was. And I cried by myself. I cried when I was alone. Not that I always want to be the strong guy, but there was something in me that wouldn't allow me to be too vulnerable when uh, I would see everybody else vulnerable. Right. And it actually decided to be something that I used in the sport, you know, because the fact that he's not here to do anything and track and field found me and in two years, I was able to be pro at it after running the event. I thought, okay. Um, so at what age did you realize, man, oh, I have, cause you, you said you were, you were fast from a young right. age, but at what point you're like, man, I can make this my life's. I didn't know about the sport of track and field when I was younger. Okay. In my area, I'd never watched an Olympics before I was in one. Yeah. Um, track and field wasn't big in my in my city. It was my junior year in high school. My junior in high school, my track coach was the football coach. And the 400 is the hardest event on the track. And we needed points. And he wanted somebody to run the 400. And I was like, uh, man, I'll run it. He was cussing us out. He was like, y'all ain't real men. Real men run the 400. I stepped up to the plate, and I won my first meet. Which, by the way, for anybody listening or watching this, if you've never done a 400, <laughs> man, I, the first time I met LaShawn, and I he comes up and he was introduced as, hey, the gold medalist in the 400, I was just like jaw dropped. Because <laughs> I'm just like, dude, that is the toughest yeah. event in yeah. all of track and field. Yeah. Like we're talking, you know, the 100, great. You know, you're super fast. You can do it for 100 meters. 200, right. same type of deal. For the unique thing about the 400 for me that I've always understood is like, it's still a sprint. It's the last 
available sprint. Like at 800, you're pacing. Right. Right. You're, you're dropping into a pace and you're making it happen. There is no pace in the 400. There's not. There's, it, uh, I mean, you are just busting your butt. And the fact <laughs> that you took that thing, I, your you coach got, was right, wasn't wrong. He yeah. wasn't wrong. I don't know what he saw afterwards. And, and when I ran it and I did well, I kept running it. People around me kept telling me, hey, you can be really good at this. What was your fastest time? In high school or ever? Could I, PR. 43 6. 43 6. Oh my goodness. I didn't I didn't look up that stat before this. That is so fast. I know like in high school, you know, like uh guys that are running for the state championship are like 57, right. 58. It's it's less than eleven seconds per hundred. Dude. Which is which is getting it. It's oh getting my it. goodness. It's, That's it's, and it's, it's a it's a long sprint. Uh, but there's different energy systems you can use within the race. Um, there's an ATP where from zero to about six seconds, you can hit it really hard and not pay for it at the back end. So I really learned the race and dissected the race and learned my body. You know, I travel the world a lot and a lot of people would tell me, you know your body better than anybody I've ever worked with. Mm. But I thought I had to do that because if I was a Formula One guy, I needed to know every bolt and screw in that car. Right. So I, early in my career, I really took the time to learn the body. So let's go back. So your high school coach recruits you in, and says, nobody's man enough to do this. Do the this, 400. Lashawn is. Yep. So and, then, and this is your freshman year or what? This is my junior year. Jun you had never run it before your junior year? I never year. run it before oh my junior my year. Oh my goodness. Oh nope. my goodness. And had you done track at all? I did 100 and 200 a little bit. Uh, ninth grade, tenth grade, but right. we didn't really have a team. Right. So it wasn't anything. We didn't even have uniforms. Yeah. We just had you wore your own blue shorts and a like a tank top. That's oh, how man. they weren't uh, invested in that sport. Right. My junior year, he wanted me to run it. I ran it. Um, I did well. State I, champ that year. I was state champ my first year running the event. That's my phenomenal. What, how fast you run it that year? Forty-seven. I ran like <laughs> forty-seven uh, six or something. And, like and that. what was second place? Oh man, probably forty-eight and some change at that wow. time. Wow. But I didn't know how to run. Between my junior and senior year, I got invited to an Olympic development camp out in uh, San Diego, right. where they invited maybe the top twenty. Uh, athletes in the country to this camp yep was this out at the uh olympic training center absolutely nice i lived right next to it for, okay for a couple uh, of years chula yeah. vista yeah yeah yeah, yeah i was yeah, in the yeah. east lake area yeah. okay yeah, now yeah. i love man and you look right over uh and is it Me new mexico on the it's mexico right there oh mexico yeah, is right on tijuana. the side yeah yeah man it's amazing i have never been to tijuana i always mm -hmm. wanted to go you never crossed the border i never crossed it over oh there. man great tacos okay okay <laughs> great tacos fish tacos chef's Just kiss baby nice um, so I, uh, I ran it. I learned a lot. I learned a lot at that from camp. these coaches. Yeah, in that co it was it was maybe a two week camp they had for us. I learned a lot. I came back my senior year and won everything. Mm. I won districts, states, junior nationals. I went on to um, world nationals. I was twelfth grade. It was. Anybody under 19 could compete at this. It was in Grosseto, Italy. Mm -hmm. My first time going over to Europe. And, and then after that, I didn't imagine how many times I would go over to Europe, right? So we went over there. I won the 400. I anchored the 4x4 four four and anchored the 4x1. Mm. So I left with three goals as a junior. Mm. And some of those records still stand to today. Oh, man. Beautiful. Yep. And got a full scholarship. I always tell kids, it's no way I was going to let my parents pay for me to go to college. I mean, they've been taking care of me my whole life. Right. So I really wanted to get a scholarship. And I had 3.2 also, so I probably could have went uh, with academics. Yep. I ended up going to East Carolina. East Carolina. Not a powerhouse for track and field, but it was three hours away from where I lived. And I didn't want to go too far because of the situation with my brother and family. I didn't want to yeah. leave and go too far. It was just enough, just far enough that I could be away, but still come home when I wanted to. Yeah. 
So let's let's tap into the mentality a little bit here. So you're you're beginning to have a lot of success, right? You're you're breaking records, setting world records, mm -hmm. you know, di different things like that at a very young age, mm -hmm. right? Your brother your brother has passed. You know, one thing that you said off camera to me, which I thought was interesting, was you said, "I'm not a very competitive guy," mm -hmm. right? And I'm like. Yeah, right. How can that be? Like, how, how, can that, how can that be? This guy, Mr. Multi-Gold Medalist, right? How can he not be competitive? So, so walk us through like some of your thought pattern, at least at this point in your career. Like you're, you're drawing on, you know, living for your brother mm -hmm. or having him live through you. Mm -hmm. um, like, yeah, what, what kind of set, started setting you apart? And what were some of the principles that you were applying? You know, I think it was after my... Freshman year in college, I ran a meet in Arkansas. I competed against all professional athletes and won. Two weeks later, Nike called me and said, look, we're gonna offer you this multi-million dollar contract for you to give up your college eligibility, but we'll continue to pay for whatever college you wanna go to. So at 18, I was pro and I had to take it as a business. Mm. So, so how did that work? So you could no longer compete at the college level, Couldn't. but you could continue to go to college. Right. Right. But then you go and you compete on in like worlds and that type of stuff. So it, it, the track and field circuit, it would be 14 meets a year, maybe okay. three in the U.S. The rest of them were in yeah. Europe, Asia, just all over. And and not only do they so they pick they're going to pay you. Do they pick up like all your travel and all that? That was I had to pay. For that. uh with my contract. So to become a professional track and athlete, you shine with a shoe company. So you have a base salary, and then you get appearance fees to show up at competitions plus uh, the prize structure. Yep. But for me, when I got into it, people were mid-20s, late-20s, families, bills, and it was serious for them. Like I would get third here, third there. People would say, ah, oh, don't worry, you're still young, you have time. But I had chosen to step into this arena with these guys. So I wanted to be the best I could be. My brother came along. That sounds competitive, though. Yeah, it, it, it was. <laughs> See, the sport was you in your own lane. Yeah. Uh, I trained alone. I would compete alone. Um, and it was just you being your best self that's what it ended up being which which is interesting because so i've i've actually studied a lot of like personal development mm -hmm. right read from the best mentors i've spent almost a million dollars on my personal education mm -hmm. with coaches and stuff and john wooden are you familiar with john wooden i'm not so coach of uh, ucla in the 70s basketball okay. team one of the greatest coaches of all time won multi multiple national i think 10 national championships okay two or three seasons undefeated, okay. right? Like phenomenal. And one of the key things that he focuses on and, and really is a focus on for many successful people, whether you're an athlete or a business owner or whatnot, is removing the competition aspect of me versus you mm. and, and actually making it internal, which is what you're talking about, right? Me versus me, becoming right. the best version of right. LaShawn right. rather than, better than, is it Michael Johnson right, or, anybody or, else. What, or anybody else? That's why I love the sport. Yeah. I love the sport because it, it's just you. You're out there. Um, all eyes on you. Nobody else determines your success. No, no, no variables. You don't have the, the linemen to get the quarterback the ball and they have to block and yeah. all these type of things. So there was something in that that I, I loved. And I also love being alone already anyway. Yeah, I, I grew up that way. Um, so the, I really feel like the sport picked me because of my character, mm -hmm. honestly. And the cars that I had dealt to me was, I had the speed, I had the, the, the unconditional love from my parents, my mom and dad. I had my dad telling me all the time I could be great. Um, I was coachable, disciplined. It, it was more disciplined than, than being motivated. Right. I've always been disciplined. Yeah. And when I got into it, man, it was just, hey, it's you against the clock. You sacrifice. The work you put in will show in this sport. And I came in at a, at, at a high level already because of DNA. Yep. I just had to put it together from ear to ear. Right. Yeah. So 
DNA got you to how fast and what would you say training and mentality mm. added? That's a good question. DNA got me, see, if, if, if I said time-wise, you may not really know. DNA got me to be a professional. Yeah. Um, my discipline and work ethic and just being able to understand and know and learn myself, that's where the greatness came. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, actually, I want you to pull out your, so for those that are watching this on Spotify and YouTube, uh, we're going we're gonna to show you the gold medals. Those that are <laughs> listening on Apple and, and Spotify, I'd, I'd invite you to tune in on, yes. on these different ones. But we got two of the gold medals here. We have this. This first one was Beijing. Ooh. This was my first Olympic gold. Look at that beauty. Olympic and, gold. And, and I think something that's unique about LaShawn that he was telling us uh, off camera was that he has shared these around the world with kids. With, and he's allowed people, a lot of people to handle them. Mm -hmm. I mean, you look at this, this <laughs> ribbon. I mean, this thing's tattered. Yes. Which, which tells me a lot about you as, as a person that like, you know, this isn't, this isn't your God. This not. This isn't your God. This isn't the epitome of your career right. right um the fact that you're willing i mean dude if you if you look on camera you're probably not gonna be able to see this but there's dings all over this this metal like <laughs> like like i said that that tells me a lot about a person that, that's yeah. like you know this is for me to share and give and absolutely and, and you know be an example to the world and you know it's it's for the people and and, and uh that that's that's really cool i appreciate it i yeah. appreciate it I have that one. That was my first one. This was probably my, and I won this race by the largest margin in Olympic history. I won by a full second. Wow. Going into that race. I had was one this your PR? Yes. This is the fastest this you ever ran? This was the fastest I ran. Yeah. Wow. It, uh, and it was early in my career, 2008. And I How didn't retire. How old were you at that time? 23. Wow. Yeah, I think I was young. about 22, 23. And I didn't retire until 2021. But this one, the year before that, I was number two in the world at world championships. I, won, I got number two in the world. The first time I had ever ran 43 seconds. And that next year, I said, I'm going to win the Olympics. Mm. I told my coach that I may have written it down. And man, the training from 2007 to 2008 was... Like walk us through that. What, what is unbelievable, like, man. You know, tell, tell us what did your daily schedule look like? It was during that time I was in Virginia, so it was still cold outside. Yep. Years later, I ended up moving to Orlando, but I can remember 5 a.m. running bridges. What is that? Just running up and down the bridge. Oh. Um, cold, windy, leaving there, getting food, taking a nap, sometimes going straight to the beach, doing sand work. Um, so like sprinting in the sand, sprinting in the sand, or, or sprinting or jogging. That 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 is tough, man. It's tough. And are you doing it in the fluffy stuff? Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. No, 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 you don't. You don't go down to where it's solid and close to the water. Right. We're back where that's man, work. It's it's work, man. That's uh, work. But the body gets used to it. Body gets used to it. I can't remember, um, man. Swimming. We did everything. We so did. How everything. many how many hours a day are you working physically? Maybe five. Five, yeah. Uh, Maybe five. Dude, five hours of physical work is five hours a is lot. a lot. And then That's the rest and the rest and recovery is just as important as right. the training. So And what did what did your diet look like? And I never had a problem with um, weight, but as far as just intake for nutrition for the muscles, a lot of fish. Um, how many calories a day? I don't even know. I never counted calories. You never, you weren't like uh, Michael nope. Phelps is like, yeah, I had 10,000 nope. calories a day. I'd open up a breakfast with 10 <laughs> pancakes, 20 slices of right. bacon. I heard like, about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, uh, I never counted calories. Okay. Um, my but whole you ate career. A lot. I ate, I ate a lot, not too much, um, but I needed to, to, I needed fuel and to, to fuel the muscles. Yeah. And I understood that. If I didn't have anything to pull from, it would pull from my muscles, and that's when injuries happen. Yeah. But that year, man, it was I was home. That that was the goal that I was actually in Virginia and actually training for. The rest of the years I was in Florida, but I was around family during that time. And 
the guy I was competing against at the time, coach was the coach of the world record holder. Mm -hmm. And the guy, the main guy who was Jeremy Warner at the time, mentor was the world record holder. Mm. So I was going against the whole history of that event, but I was still so confident. I don't know how I was so confident. I prepared well, yeah. that's why. The, re the, the preparation was so intentional that every rep in the gym, every step on the track was recorded. Mm. I would go back and look at film. My coach at the time worked at a news station and he would bring me in 12, one o'clock at night or in the morning, AM. Yeah. And we would just look at film. We would look at film. I'm talking about so every step. You're studying, you're recording, you're working out. What did your visualization process look like at this point? Uh, man, I could have a stopwatch at this time. Close my eyes, hit the stopwatch, and stop it exactly where I wanted to stop it. 43, 44 seconds. So I could see. So you could see every I could see step. It. I could see it. I could, to the point wow. where sometimes I would do it and you would see my body like leaning into a curve or I'll go like this. Um, but that became powerful for me throughout my career. Yeah. Just having a, a coach's eye, studying film, and being able to close my eyes and, and see. As I close my eyes right now, I get a feeling of. Like my hands are getting sweaty. It's weird. <laughs> yeah. Like I, I get a. You're having a, real physical yeah, yeah, it happens, impact man. from the visualization. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. And it's nothing that. Now I'm gonna fast forward a little bit to right now in my life. There's a lot of things that I realized I was doing that I didn't study at the time. I didn't read on it. No one told me to do these things, and now I'm in a room with a lot of people who have invested in the things that I just did natural mm. um so i'm learning about all these things that i did and how powerful they were especially the visualization the uh, just sacrifice and that inner voice that i had things that weren't so common um out in the real world but was common for me so what were like some of the things that your inner voice would tell you Right, because when I when I've had success in my life, right, there's different times where I have like phrases that I repeat right. over and over again. What were some of those while you're training, or right. even what were some that you tell yourself while you're running? Right. So training, I had to have it because we have interval work. I'll run in practice six two hundreds at a fast pace, but sometimes I may have thirty seconds or forty five seconds in between the the reps, and the purpose of training is stress adaptation. You're learning to stress your body. It's all about stressing your body so that the competition is stress management. Right. So while I'm stressing the body, stressing the body, um, I'm down on the ground. I've just ran extremely fast. I have 30 seconds. My coach is on the other side of the track. It's just me. I trained by myself a lot. Right. I never was in really big groups. So I'm on the side of the track and my coach is like 30 seconds and I'm on the ground sweating, probably snot coming from my nose, all yep. kinds of things. And it's, I have to get up and give the same amount of energy for this next rep. And so the what, next are, rep. what are the words that you're telling and yourself in that moment? It's okay. You got this. You got this. A lot of it is okay. My brother name was Antoine. All right, Antoine, come on. We got this. I know he wasn't here to do anything. So I just, I kept him with me. So um, a lot of, I am who I am. Uh, you are the best. The fact, it really came down to the fact that he wasn't here to max. He may have maximized his, who, who knows? But I don't think he maximized his potential or got to do the things he wanted to do in life. Right. So I had to maximize the opportunity that I had. And I always brought him with me. Even before I would step on a track, I would say a prayer and let him know, hey, all right, all right, bro, here we go. Let, let's get this done. And I would get a sense of like calmness over my body when I would talk to him. And he would talk to me and he was always listening and watching. He just wasn't in the stands. He was just listening and watching from from uh, up high. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm a I'm a I'm a believer that uh, those that pass on, they, they're around us. Yeah. Right? And and uh, I mean, you it sounds like you were able to 
you know, experience this. Yeah, I tapped and, into and, that for sure. Yeah, that's that's yeah. that's pretty awesome. And downloaded everything he wanted me to me to do and downloaded and, and was able to block everything out when it was time to execute because I had prepared well and with intention. Yeah. That's uh that's phenomenal. Yeah. Um so this year while you're training before you go and you do your personal record and you mm -hmm. win by a second, are you visualizing yourself on the top of that stand? Is that a big motivating factor or is it just, I want to be the best LaShawn has to offer? You know, I had already ran against everybody who I was competing against. Yeah. When I got to Beijing, I walked the track. All the tracks are kind of set different. The straightaways may be longer than the curves sometimes. So I want to know exactly what I was dealing with. Yeah. We walk the track, um, know my spots. I would study my competitors. I knew who was in each lane. I knew what they ran in the first round and the second round, because it's three rounds. Yep. Um, I knew their tendencies, who, who would get out hard, who would die. I didn't use any of this when once I competed, but I took it as another race. Right. You know, I had to take it just like, okay, I ran against all these guys already and I beat them already. Right. So let's not get too shaken up by the magnitude of the race. Let's just go in and handle it just like another race. And that's what I did. I walked out in the finals. I can, I can remember it like it was yesterday. Um, I walked out, uh, I was probably in the middle lane, but for some reason, I always walk slow to the blocks. Yeah. You know, it's, they line us up one, two, three, four. If I was number four or five. What's the best lane to be in out of uh, eight? It just depends what type of runner you're in. If you're in the middle, you can actually see the whole field. So you like the I like, the, like the, middle. the middle. But if you're on the outside, you have less of a curve. Like right. back in the day, you couldn't even set a world record out in lane eight or nine because you weren't dealing with as much centrifugal force as the other uh, that makes sense. athletes in the right. lane. So can't lean into yeah, it. You much. can't lean as much. You're almost running like a straight line almost. Yeah, yeah. So for me, I, I like the inside because I never was an athlete who wanted to just smash the, the, the competition. I just wanted to win mm -hmm. because I took it as a business and I would run two meets a week sometimes. So I didn't want to exert myself too much. But this race, it was, I remember walking up to the blocks or, or, or just walking down the 100 meters to the blocks and walking really slow, and just taking everything in, not necessarily the crowd, but just, okay, we're here. Like, I, I'm from a small city and I'm here at the Olympic Games. So you're reflecting on everything that's gotten you to Got this me to, point. Yeah, then it's like, okay, I'm here, and I'm here because I'm supposed to be here. So I'm gonna pause you there for a second. I think this is like such an important thing that anybody does in life, whether you're a business leader or an athlete or whatnot, is that you actually reflect in the moment mm -hmm. of what, like what to be grateful for, what mm -hmm. the path has looked like. Mm -hmm. Like for me, and, and it sounds like this is the same thing for you. It's like that grit that got you there is what's going to push you over the edge Absolutely. in, in, in the, the moment. moment. Absolutely. And unless you take that opportunity to reflect and get the fuel, right. you're going to miss out on a Absolutely. huge opportunity. Which, which for me, I learned to channel my butterflies. So as I'm walking out, you have these butterflies, you get this, this nervous sensation. But I was able to, I told myself this um, because I was running before that and I said, there's no way I'm going to get to this line and be nervous. I know I'm prepared. And I ended up channeling the butterflies. And when I would feel something, oh, that's just letting me know that I prepared, I prepared. Mm -hmm. All these butterflies, I'm prepared, I prepared, I prepared. And I'm the, the head butterfly. So I'm making this arrow with these butterflies and I'm the head butterfly. Preparation, preparation, preparation. Oh yeah, I did handle that, I did do this, I did do that. Now I'm creating this type of, I don't know what I was doing at the time, but I had to channel that some type of way. I love it because I mean, <laughs> because butterflies can be viewed as a negative thing, right? Absolutely. I'm nervous. I'm not, uh, I'm, I'm a little scared, right. maybe a little fearful, right. what, what, whatever it is. And you're taking that and you're saying you're checking against all the previous actions. Like, yeah, that's me. Mm -hmm. I did that. Yeah. I prepared this way. I suppose that, to be here. I yeah. belong here, man. I love it. Uh, got into the blocks and it goes silent. It goes silent. You, when you walk and you see people, but if I walked 10 meters and I saw a person in the stands and I walked to meters, I couldn't tell you what that person had on. Like it just, 
I would see people and then it'll blank out, it'll blank out, it'll blank out. Yeah, it's straight to, as I walk to the blocks, it's more tunnel vision. And they introduce us and you wave the camera and everything and then you just get locked in. Like it goes silent. And there's a sense of you belong here, it's time to go. It's so many, it's so intense because if you flinch, you can get DQ'd. Dude, you're giving me the shivers right now. Just yeah, listen to this, like, man. They, they have pressure blocks. So if you're getting in the blocks, and if you just do this before they shoot the gun, right. you're done. Done. So it's, it's, it's total doubt in um, the gun goes off, and I already know what I have to do. It's like I'm floating. So on this particular gun, did you feel like you shot right out? Uh, like, was there any hesitation there? No, I was I was gone. I had already ran the preliminary and the semifinal, so everything was dialed in. My chiropractor had lasered me up. We did a lot of quantum neurology. My nervous system was on point. Um, I was ready to go. So real quick, preliminary and semifinal, how'd you do? Did you win both those Win events? both of those. Okay, yeah. so now gun goes off. This is the third day, so I had maybe a Friday, Saturday, or whatever, and then this is the third day. Gun goes off. Um, I get to my spots. It's okay. Get You're to 60. Them. Yeah, I'm seeing it. I had walked the track. I had already ran two rounds. Get to your spots. Be comfortable. Um, be confident. I got around the curve, got down the back stretch, and was just floating. I knew exactly what I had to do. I got around the curve, and I still felt good. I still felt good. Not a lot of talking to myself at this time. It's just it's, 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 it's ingrained in me. The crucial part or the critical zone in the 400 is the last hundred. Yeah, That's when everything falls apart. That's when it separates the men from the boys. And I did a body check up in the curve right before I got into the last What does that check. mean, a body check? Body check is make sure your chin is down, make sure your arms aren't flared out, make sure you're in the best sprint position you can be in. While everything wants to fall apart, you have to be strong and dialed in here and know exactly what you need to do and put your body in the best position to handle this last part of this race. And I just was stepping through it, man. I remember not looking too far at the finish line because I didn't want to deal with this like depth perception. I would focus maybe 10 meters ahead of me on the ground, which would keep my chin down and would just keep me stepping. And I did that, I looked down, I was stepping, I was stepping, I looked up at the jumbotron and halfway that the um, hundred, maybe 50 meters, I looked up, man, nobody was around me. And- So you're not looking side to side. No, I, at that point, I didn't feel so anything. So you had you had no idea whether or not there were people I there. Didn't, I didn't know where they were. Okay. Um, But I had a tendency of always being able to look at the jumbotron, because as you're running, the jumbotron is right there, you can see everybody. I looked up and nobody was around. And that, so what's go, what goes through your mind when nobody's around or like, what do you feel? Or you're like, oh, I can let up or I got to turn on the, what, what, it is, was, what goes through it? It was get to the finish line. Hurry up and get to the finish line, but don't tighten up. Yeah. Go to the basics, uh, keep your arms open, keep stepping forward, keep your chin down and get through this line. Make sure you run 405 meters through this line because is there is there like a feeling of excitement like holy crap I'm gonna do this, or is it are you still just totally <laughs> dialed in? I think it? I'm still dialed in. Wow. I think I'm still dialed in, and it didn't hit me until I crossed the finish line, and I didn't really show a lot of passion for it because before, I thought about it as just another race. Mm. I said, okay, this is just another race. Let's get through it. When I got through it, it was a it was a big relief for me once I crossed the finish line because, I mean, Olympic Games is the pinnacle of the sport. Yeah. And to be Olympic champion, I didn't dream of it before I started training for it. Yeah. Like I said, I wasn't a fan of the sport. Yeah. I wasn't a fan of any sport, really. Well, baseball, I played baseball a lot when I was younger. So when I crossed the line, I felt like, whew, it's done. Mm. Not like, relief. oh, I'm a, yeah, a, a, a feeling of relief, not necessarily this, rush of excitement that I was Olympic champion. It was, whew, I got that done. And then I could hear everything. I could hear the crowd then. I could smell things then. Then I could, I, I tapped into, well, I got into a sense right afterwards of, 
man, I got to I won, but they coming for me now. Oh. They are coming for me now. Um, didn't get too high. Never got too high in any of my accomplishments. You know, I've always rode everything. If it was a 10, that was a 10. I would ride it at like, a, in, in, like an eight. Yeah. Just because I knew that this was a business and I had to do it over again. So I didn't really, I was in the moment so much, so many times that I really didn't celebrate a lot of my success. Yeah. yeah I just knew that I had to do it again. Yeah. And I loved the fact of training and, and the process. I would fall in love with the process. So I guess I fell in love with the process of training and I had a process with winning when I would. Yeah. Training was to make it comfortable when I would go out and compete. Maybe because I wasn't such, I wasn't this competitor or super competitive where I would feed from my competitors. I would feed from my preparation. I love it. So it was more of that. And after that, man, I, I won world championships the next year and, and so set my mark. So I wanna, I wanna for the you or for the viewers. Uh, uh, you know, a couple principles that you've extracted mm -hmm. here, right? That, that apply to everything. Mm -hmm. Like one, when you're running this 400 and your last, that last hundred and, and the finish line is ahead. Mm -hmm. The fact that you didn't focus on the finish line, you right. focused on the next 10, 10 Absolutely. meters, right? And that is such a key principle to success mm -hmm. that we never are so caught up in like, how high the mountain is or how far away it is or whatever else, but we just focus on the controllable. How do I control the next few mm -hmm. steps, right? Mm -hmm. Like that is that is a key, uh, I've done, you know, hundreds of interviews and spoken with thousands of entrepreneurs and had my own success. And like, that is a common principle that is extracted is like okay. the control that night. And I love that, yeah, like this applies to everything. And, and Absolutely. Uh, you know, and, and the, the other thing is like controlling your emotion, right? Mm -hmm. Like. No too, no too high, no too low, mm -hmm. right? Whether I win or I lose, I keep it right at a seven or an eight. And I win or lose, I'll always have unconditional love for my parents. Yeah, I love that. No stress in that. The the most, the, you still keep the most important things first, right? Right, like like there, it's it's so interesting. Like regardless of what you're doing, whether you're running, running a business, a family, uh, building a community. The principles of success are the same, mm -hmm. right? And mm -hmm. and, it, and it's and it's awesome just extracting these from your story and mm -hmm. seeing how they apply in running the four hundred meter mm -hmm. and winning the Olympic gold and mm -hmm. like that. That is that is just so awesome. Yeah, so, it. what point was the pinnacle of this whole experience? Was it the training? Was it crossing the finish line? It doesn't sound like it was crossing the finish mm -hmm. line. Was it was it standing on top? Here in the national anthem, like what what was the pinnacle of the whole experience? You know, I I really believe once I got my medal and at the top of the podium, I was closer to my brother. Mm. I really feel that. I feel like I'm here. They're playing the national anthem, and at the top of the podium, he's watching from up above, and we did it. Like we did it. We 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 have to do it again, but. For this moment, what I wanted to do, I got done. The best in the world, Olympic Games, everybody's watching, and it, it doesn't get any bigger than that. Yeah. And that was that was a moment for me. Like you said, the preparation was what it was. I, I, I don't mind training hard yeah. daily, day, day after day, and not even seeing results daily, but just yeah. putting that grind in. Winning the race, like I said, it, I had competed against those guys already. Um, but you never know the outcome of a race, yeah. right? And th that last day standing up on that podium, man, it was for, like I said, it was for everybody. Yeah. You know, it's, it, I, I have these in Sharon because this is actually real for those that, that, yeah. that can see. 2016. And 2016, real? yeah, so Beautiful. it was for everybody. So it definitely had to be that moment of standing on top of the podium and coming back home to Virginia and my family being at the airport. Uh, oh man. That was the pinnacle. Man, I love that. Thinking about it now, I love that. That's and awesome. it was just, it let me know that I was loved. Um, sense of gratitude because I did have help from my parents praying for me. 
uh, my coaches, my chiropractors. It's, it's definitely a team. Yeah. But I had to go out there and execute, and I did it. And and there was a lot of people who wanted that gold, and I got it. <laughs> That's pretty awesome. Yeah. So, you know, you go on, you get injured in the 2012, mm. uh, which obviously was difficult. And then later you come back and you win the four by four in the 2016 right. uh, in Rio. It's just phenomenal. Then you end up retiring in 2021. Yeah. So let's let's talk let's talk about that because, you know, being at the height of your career and and the the champion of the world, right? Right. It, that's that's some place that most people will never get to. Right. Right. How do you transition from that, like, to what you're doing now? Where do you find passion? Where do you find where do you find growth? It was hard. It was hard, man, to be honest with you. I felt like I dealt with a serious identity crisis. Yeah. Like I said, I don't study people or read a lot of uh, books based on different things. So, uh, like I said, I, I was experiencing things. I was going through things that I didn't know. It became natural to me. But afterwards, I didn't become the Olympic gold medalist in life. Um, I didn't walk around wearing it on my shoulders. You know, I did it because I was good at it. Uh, I, I had the character to maximize potential and I had the ability to execute in, in certain moments. And after the sport, I didn't know what I was going to do. And I really thought I was going to be able to pour into a wife and kids when I was done. And that was going to be like a passion and a purpose for me but it wasn't there. And then I thought, okay, man, do I do something where I try to go to the max again? Like that took a lot. Like I sacrificed a lot, a lot of relationships. I wasn't able to figure out what I like to do because I poured into the sport. So who am I right. outside of this guy everybody see me as and I don't even care about? Yeah. Then I, I contacted a guy who I worked with for a long time, and he said, you've always talked to kids, you speak well, won't you get into the realm of, of motivational speaking and just telling your story because your story is unique and there's a lane for that. You can craft that and get paid and, and share and change lives with your story. So I said, okay, I mean, I could do that. And now um, I'm studying and, 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 and reflecting on moments that I forgot about. Mm. That's a lot of that going on. I was so uh, focused in like the moments of training or walking on the track that I didn't remember a lot of it. Yeah. So I'm having to go back and write things down. Um, I started my foundation. Well, I already had the foundation, but I reinstated it. And... I just want to be able to share resources, um, give hope. I understand the mind, body, spirit approach to sports and life in general. Um, be able to give opportunities like people gave me when I was in high school later on. When I was in high school, like I said, I, people didn't even know who I was until later in like my late 12th grade year when a guy came and bought me a uniform mm. and bought me spikes. Mm. and paid for me to go to competitions in Texas and Louisiana and New York. If it wasn't for him, I wouldn't have been able to do that. I wouldn't have been able to see what else was out there. Uh, so I really want to give that back through the foundation in any way that I can. And the speaking is, is I'm, I'm learning it. I'm learning it, man. I'm learning it. It's becoming a passion of mine because I get to give back. Yeah. I get to let people know how I handle certain situations. And is uh, people handle situations in life in general, but I was told there was a uniqueness of, of mine. Yeah. So if I can share that and, and change someone's perspective on how they're approaching something or how they may be dealing with an, uh, a difficult time in life or how to deal with success to keep it going, because I ended up being number one in the world for many years. Right. And that was because of doing the work and noticing the success, but like I said, not riding it at that 10. Yeah. Just kind of keeping it at that eight so I can stay with the fundamentals and keep it going forward. So the passion right now and the purpose is 
building relationships, um, getting around individuals who are not just like-minded. Like I'm around these athletes a lot when I was in this bubble who were athletes. You know, they work hard. Many of them didn't understand the rest and recovery part that I understood. They always wanted to go do something when I was either in a training room or at home or studying film or stretching. And I have that unconditional love for my parents. You know, from having that, I feel like it sets me apart from just a normal athlete because I was competitive. I did maximize it, but I didn't really care about what I was doing. It's weird. Not, not, I wouldn't say care about what I was doing. What I was doing, I didn't let it define me. I always knew there was something more. Different in identity. Absolutely. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. I love that. Man, I'm, I'm excited for, for you in the next, you know, really level of your, of your life. I right. That, that's not necessarily defined by athletics, right. but, de but defined by who you are because right. you're, you're clearly an incredible person. Yeah. And I don't know why I, why I feel this. I feel like I have the DNA, I have the DNA, but to put it together here, I feel like I can take that and put it in any lane. Yeah. You know, and my dad, it, it trips me out because my dad, is always like, um, he probably could have been an athlete. And he always say, man, I don't know what I would have done had I been given that speed and ability. But sometimes it jumps generations. Yeah. And he actually wanted to be famous. He would be famous had he not had kids and where his story is, he had kids early. He had to work all his life. Um, but he's a super dad, so he don't feel like he got a chance to maximize whatever he was here for, and, and it hit I, me. And I, and I I think he did though. Yeah. Like like I mean, obvious. You know, some people have different callings, right. and clearly his calling was to be a great dad. Absolutely. And and to infuse you with the knowledge, the dream, the power to be able to go and fulfill your mission. Right. And I think like your mission is going to give him fulfillment. Absolutely. Absolutely. Which, which is which is phenomenal, and I yeah. think that you're you're doing a great service to both your dad and your brother. Yeah, I appreciate it. Yeah, I man. I, I, I Lashawn, man, thank you for your time. Yeah. Thanks for hanging with us on on the show. It, it's been it's a pleasure. I'm sharing these principles, and your <laughs> journey, and and all the good stuff. Where's a good place uh, for the listeners to to give you a, a follow? Is it Instagram? Where's yeah. the best spot? That's Instagram. Instagram is uh, at Lashawn Merritt. They ended up calling me the machine. The machine. The machine. So I'm Love like it. machine merit. It's because I, at the end of the race, it was who was going to decelerate the least. And I always handled the critical zone. I broke, I, I never really broke down in my race. So they called me the machine. So it's machine merit actually, but LaShawn Merit on Instagram. I have Facebook. Uh, I do Twitter some, but more Instagram. I love it. You actually bring up a great point, and I'll, we'll just talk about one more part of your race, but I can't remember if it was the 08 4x4 or the 16 4x4. I was watching it yesterday. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we were, we were uh, throwing it on in our Uber. Like, <laughs> oh, man, we're, we're interviewing LaShawn tomorrow. We, we got to see uh, some right. of the old races. And there was a there was a point you came in, your anchor, I think you were in like third or fourth, uh -huh. and you come around that edge, and you clearly weren't going to be able to take the inside lane. And you decided to take the outside. Oh, no. You were watching a world championship. Oh, was that a world championship? That was world championship. Oh, man. Yeah. It was awesome. Yeah. And I kind of, yeah, yeah. They ended up calling that the Virginia Shuffle. Mm. <laughs> that was so weird. Yeah. I, uh, I think it was, ah, it was Jamaica and somebody else. And they had me boxed in. Yeah. They had me boxed in. But it's, it's, it's such like a, when you're in this moment, and I think you, you're right. I got the baton like third. Yeah. I got the baton and this moment is, is so surreal when you have two people in front of you and you're going for this, this, this major title and I can still have a sense of calmness in that. I watched that not too long ago too. And I got the baton and I was so calm and relaxed. I think the, the commentator was even saying how calm and relaxed I was. 
and I had to pick the perfect spot to make a move. I don't know where that came from, but I, but I, I felt boxed in and I knew I only had a hundred to go, and I did like a little shuffle. Yeah, move, you like right? shimmy. It was yeah. like, it was like, whoa, man, that's crazy to do while sprinting. It just took off. Yeah, it just took off, man. Yeah. That uh, I look at those moments and sometimes I think, man, that 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 was me. I forget about moments a lot. I, I, I saw a thing that recently, I mean, not too long ago, where it showed a lot, all of my accomplishments. And I was talking to a group of uh, athletes, but they had all my accomplishments on this like screen behind me. And I was talking, I was talking, I would look back, I would talk, I would look back, and I was amazed on oh. how much I, I, I've done. Yeah. It's amazing on how much, uh, I've done how much time I spent in the sport. It's my only job. It's 17 years. It feels like five. Yeah. It, it went so fast, but I was so dialed in. Double head sword because I was so dialed in that I, I don't have family and I missed out on a lot of things in life that I really care about, but I'm still here. I have six nieces and nephews. I get to be an amazing uncle. All of them are in sports. Hey, you're still young, 37. Still uh, young. Yeah, I'm still young. Hey, ladies, I don't know if you heard, <laughs> but the man's on the market. All right, he's a family man, yeah. athlete. He's gonna, you know, produce some great offspring. <laughs> <laughs> so get at him on on yeah. Instagram. Yeah. Uh, you know, none of none of the, you know, we we only want good, wholesome <laughs> women. That uh, absolutely, yeah, we, we're lo we're looking for a good one. Okay, yeah, we're I'm looking here. for a good one for you. Yeah, I appreciate it. I appreciate <laughs> it. But man, I, I think I think what you're bringing up though, like looking back at your accomplishments, that's this is like this is life, this is success. Mm -hmm. Because when you're in it, you, it it doesn't necessarily register. Right, it just seems like another day. Right, because what made you who you are is doing another day right. over absolutely. and over again, over and over, and not complaining. Right, I never was a guy to complain. The sport is accountability. It's just you. And yeah. any team sports, if you're a pro, you show up late, you get fined. You do this, you get fined. Right. Sport of track and field, I didn't have to show up every day to no. training. It was you. But I love that. That the process and the isolation. I felt I I, I developed greatness through my isolation, positive uh affirmations within the inner voices that I had, the unconditional love for my parents. The great character recipe for success. Awesome. Man, I love everything that you're you. about and what you share today. What is one last piece of advice that you would give to somebody that's thinking about giving up, not pushing through, mm. whether it's giving up on life, mm. giving up on the next level of success, giving up on launching their business? What piece of advice you mm. give to that person? You know, you have to get uh you have to get past it to get through it. Um, or you got to get through it to get past it. Mm. Life is hard. There's ups and downs. But I always feel like if you take some time by yourself, understand yourself, understand what your inner voice tells you, and proper preparation prevents piss poor performance. Mm. Proper preparation prevents, prevents piss poor performance. Ooh. Yeah. Man, that might be the title of the show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I'm all about preparing well to execute and never forget the basics and take mm. it a step, a step at a time. Mm. LaShawn, thank you so much, my thank man. You. Thank, thank you for you. your time. Thank yes, you sir. for being a giver. Thank you for sharing these gold medals with the world and not, uh, you know, hiding them behind a piece of glass yeah, man. <laughs> and uh, just being a man of the people that's sharing it with the world, sharing it with the kids, giving hope, giving, giving dreams, dude. Appreciate you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Until next time.